Revelation study, everybody. Tonight we're going to be looking at the sixth seal and the in, the first interlude. And so um, before we do that, I want to do some review tonight. So one of the things I want you guys to remember as we're studying the book of Revelation is that John is presenting two warring kingdoms. Do you guys remember what those kingdom are? those two kingdoms are one is the kingdom of god and one is the kingdom of satan so we're beginning to see this war uh played out in the book of revelation as the seals are opened and we began the great tri tribulation a, uh, a couple of weeks ago and so if you ask my opinion the four writers of the apocalypse that we saw uh represented demonic forces at play we know that the first horseman, at least, represented Satan, and because he and the spirit of the Antichrist, because he was the white horse that um, was kind of like the imposter. So, what did each seal represent? So, uh, let's jump forward here. So, remember this: the the seals and this the three sets of seven. It's not a mathematical formula, but it's more like a a pattern that we see in Revelation, kind of like a musical pattern. So we saw the first horseman, the rider on the white horse, he represented false peace. The rider on the red horse, world war. The rider on the black horse, severe global famine. And then the rider on the pale horse, which represented death. And then we went, we came to the first woe. And the first woe was the martyrdom of the believers. So notice that each seal, there seems to be a progression from things are getting uh, bad to worse. And, and I think uh, we're going to see that continue here. Uh, let's take a look at uh, our first verse today, which is going to be uh, chapter 6, verses 12 through 14. I watched as the lamb broke the sixth seal, and there was a great earthquake. The sun became as dark as black cloth, and the moon became as red as blood. Then the stars of the sky fell to the earth like green figs, falling from a tree shaken by a strong wind. The sky was rolled up like a scroll, and all the mountains and islands were removed from their places. So what kind of language would you call this? Somebody said, how would you describe this? Well, apocalyptic language. This is apocalyptic language. It's the end of the world type language. John's describing what it's going to be like at the end of the world. So this is what the Bible sometimes refers to as the day of the Lord. Uh, same language that we find in the Old Testament to describe the end of the world. Uh, we can look at some of those passages in the Old Testament, uh, Joel uh, 2, if I can find it, Joel 2.31, the sun will become dark and the moon will turn blood red before the great and terrible day of the Lord arrives. And you can look up some of those other Bible verses I have right there on your own. A similar language here is what I'm trying to get you to notice. A similar apocalyptic style language. Basically, what I like to call game over. When, you, when you're in the arcade and you, you, you spent your last quarter back in the 80s and... Uh, your life power is getting drained down to zero, and all of a sudden you get shot or whatever. Big letters come across the screen, game over. That's what we see here. It's game over. The, wor the scroll, the world is rolled up. Uh, we see that language. Uh, the scroll uh, being rolled is apocalyptic. Uh, it's, it, the world is being rolled up, so to say, like a scroll. When you when you open a scroll, it's 
it's read by, you know, you unroll a portion and then you roll up the other portion. So this imagery here uh, is that the, the, the scroll of the world, basically, is finished. Uh, the scroll of the world is over. This is why we get so many interpretations for the Great Tribulation, because it's confusing. Um, if this marks the end, then the seven seals, the seven trumpets, and the seven bowls are not in chronological order. That means that they must overlap. So, are we talking about overlap, or are we talking about chronology here? I, I personally believe that they overlap. They must overlap in some way, but the but how remains a mystery. And I believe that uh, God intended for there to be mystery in the book of Revelation because um, we're not supposed to know when exactly um, these things are going to happen. We're supposed to be watching for the signs, pre being prepared for the day of the Lord. Um, being prepared is more important than knowing when. Uh, according to God. Uh, that's what my opinion is. So let's look at verse 15. Then everyone, the kings of the earth, the rulers, the generals, the wealthy, the powerful, and every slave and free person, all hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains. Basically, we see a progression from the mighty to the weak, from the rich to the poor. No, no person on the earth from the poor to the rich, from the powerful and the weak. No one's going to be able to escape this seal. Uh, you know, some, some of the rich and the famous and the powerful, they might have been able to escape some of the effects from the previous seals. Maybe some of them have ha, uh, will have war bunkers and things and food supplies and rations and who knows what else people might have when the day of the Lord comes. <clears throat> but here, the vision is making clear that no one is going to escape this seal. So let's look at verse 16 and 17. And they cry to the mountains and the rocks, Fall on us and hide us from the face of the one who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who is able to survive? So here we see a change. In the, in the fifth seal, we saw the martyrs crying out, How long before you judge the world? Crying out to God. In the Lamb. God told them they had to wait a little bit longer. Uh, they had to wait on the until the other martyrs had joined them. And so the time has obviously come because the seal brings God's judgment on the entire world. Look at this passage again. Who are the people hiding from? They're hiding from Father God and the Lamb. And why does it say they are hiding? Because the great day of wrath has come. Plain and simple. And then finally, the final question. Who is able to survive? This is a rhetorical question. The answer is obvious. No one. <clears throat> the, no one's going to be able to survive this day of wrath. That's the point in this passage. And this is where John puts on the brakes. And not so much John, but the, the visions put on the brakes here. We, we take a step back. We slow down. Um, if John did not put the car in reverse, so to say, this would be the end of the tribulation. This would be the end of God's judgment on the earth. But there is more to be said. Basically, the seven seals were like an overview of the Great Tribulation, in my opinion. And so Jesus backs up and he begins to begins a new series of revelations. Uh, 
before we uh, back up too far, though, we get this break. We get this interlude. And so chapter 7 begins with the interlude. Obviously, I made a little error on my PowerPoint here. We, um, didn't put the animation in the right spot. Uh, so let's look at verse 1. Then I saw four angels standing at the four corners of the earth, holding back the four winds, so they did not blow on the earth or the sea or even on any tree. So my in interpretation is that um, chronologically, this takes place sometime before the sixth seal was open. Why do I say that? So. I'm not sure how much far back we must go, but at least before the sixth seal, uh, be, because this is this is uh, the, to take us back before God's wrath is finally poured out. And and notice here that John starts by saying, "Then I saw." The then does not have a chronological meaning. Remember that uh, Revelation is not in chronological order. It's in logical order. This is a new vision. So, what does John see? He sees four images, uh, four angels holding back the four winds of, uh, from the sea, from the land, and from the trees. And the this represent this wind represents uh, God's sweeping judgment. And so this takes place before the day of the Lord, because God's judgment obviously, <clears throat> hasn't been released yet. In verse 2 and 3, let's look at those two verses now that you've been staring at those two points now. And I saw another angel coming from the east, carrying the seal of the living God. And he shouted to those four angels who had been given power to harm the land and sea, Wait! Don't harm the land or the sea or the trees until we have placed the seal of God. On the foreheads of his servants. So, what does John see? He sees another angel. And what is that angel doing? He is carrying, he is carrying the seal of God. He is carrying the signet ring of God. What what God would use to seal these wax seals, so to say. It's his mark on his ring. A signet ring was used by the king officials uh, for documents and, and other important uh, items. And who is the angel talking to? The four angels who are holding back the four winds of God's wrath. And what does the angel say? Do not harm the earth until the slaves of God are sealed on their forehead. On their forehead. So this seal <clears throat> is a stamp of God. He's going to place his seal, his, his sign, on the foreheads of those people. And somehow this seal of God is going to offer um, God's people some kind of protection when God's wrath comes. It's like the blood that was placed on the doorposts of um, Israel's doorpost during the Passover, when the when the angel passed over. So let's go to verse. And I heard how many were marked with the seal of God. One hundred and forty-four thousand were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. All right, so. We have come to one of the top five, maybe top three, most controversial passages in all of Revelation. The 144,000. So, I hope I've been preparing you for this number all along. Um, because we get a clue. There is a clue in the passage as to who these 144 people are. The clue is found in verse 4. Let me read verse 4 again. And I heard how many 
were marked with the seal of God. 144,000 were sealed from all the tribes of Israel. There's a clue there. If you've been paying attention to the Revelation study, you'll know what that clue is. Um, then I heard. That's our clue. It's what John says. Then I heard. I have been preparing you for this moment from the beginning of Revelation. I've shown you that every time that John says, then I heard something, uh, what he e hears always corresponds with what he sees. So keep that in mind. Let's review a, a few of those. So uh, we've seen that um, in first in Revelation 1.10. If you guys remember, Revelation 1.10. <clears throat> it was the Lord's day, and I was worshiping in the Spirit. Suddenly I heard behind me a loud voice like a trumpet blast. And we know that that trumpet blasting voice was the voice of Jesus. And then John turns, and he sees a vision of Jesus. So what John heard corresponded with what he saw. And then the second one is Revelation 5.5. 5. Uh, actually, um, right before that, he hears, he hears the sound of the lion of the tribe of Judah coming. And then he turns and sees the lamb who appeared as if it had been slain. So the lion is the lamb. The voice of the trumpet blasting voice was the vision of Jesus. The lion was the lamb. So here again, John hears something. He hears the number of those who have been sealed. Are you following me? I hope you're following me so far. So is this number, the 144,000, which is so controversial, is it literal or symbolic? Well, I don't really know, but I think it's symbolic. Even if it's not literal, I really doubt that it's literal, but even if it was literal, it has symbolic meaning. So let's talk about its symbolic meaning and what it means symbolically. I am of the opinion that this is just a symbolic number. Um, Hang on, I've lost my place. Let me just say that I think it's it's very crucial when you're doing Revelation to pay attention to what he hears versus what he sees. And if you're not paying attention, if a biblical scholar is not paying attention to that in their biblical studies, I don't think they're doing this um, passage justice. But remember, he hears the 144,000, and this number doesn't really mean that it is literal. And so it really doesn't matter if it's literal or symbolic, but I think it's symbolic. Um, there's very little, uh, there's very few uh, literal passages in Revelation. And when they are literal, usually John tells us what that it, they are literal and what they mean. So most of Revelation is a symbolic book. Um, the number 12 represents Israel and the church. This is always The number 12 has re always represented Israel and the church. And the number 10 represents completion. And 1,000 is perfect completion. So we get the number 144,000 by multiplying 12 times 12 and then multiplying that by 1,000. So John tells us, 144,000 is the number sealed from all the tribes from Israel. So let's look at verses 5 through 8. From Judah, 12,000. From Reuben, 12,000. From Gad, 12,000. Asher, 12,000. Naphtali, 12,000. Manasseh, 12,000. Simon, 12,000. Levi, Issachar, Zebulon, Joseph, Benjamin, all 12,000. So now John has proceeded to give us an account of this number that he hears. He hears 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes of Israel. 
again, do I think this is literal 12,000 Jews or whatever or symbolic? No, I do not. I, I just feel like it's symbolic. Um, I don't, I do not believe this is literal. What is Jesus trying to show John is that the, the, um, the perfect number of people will be sealed. Not one person will be unaccounted for. They will all be accounted for. That's the meaning of this. He's not trying to give us so much as a literal uh, 12,000 from each tribe of, of Israel will be saved, but the perfect amount. Not one person will be unaccounted for when it's time to be sealed. The number is complete. And yes, the number represents Israel, all of Israel. Uh, some people try to say that this is just Jews. But, like I said, we got to pay attention to the book of Revelation and not try to read into it too much. So Jews will come to Christ for their salvation during the tribulation. That is true. And most of the church in the first century was made up of Jews. However, there is more to Israel than just the Jews. Anyone who has placed their faith in the promise of Abraham is accounted as a son of Abraham. Anyone who places their faith in the promise is grafted in into the nation of Israel. So Paul calls Israel the root and the branches to that which have been grafted into the root and the branches. So in the end... There is only one kingdom. There is only one family. There's not two. It's not Israel and the church. There is just one kingdom, one family. Uh, Paul said there is no longer uh, Jew or Greek, slave or free, male and female. We are all one in Christ Jesus. That's important in trying to get a correct interpretation of Revelation in this passage. And the key is verse 9. So let's take a look at verse 9. This is the key verse. After this, I saw a vast crowd, too great to count, from every nation and tribe and people and language standing in front of the throne and before the Lamb. They were clothed in white robes and held palm branches in their hands. So John hears the number sealed. This is key. He hears the number sealed, the 144,000. Then he turns and sees. He turns and sees. What does John turn and see? John sees all of God's children from every tribe, every nation, every people, and every language standing before Father God and the Lamb. This is important. What John hears always corresponds with what he sees. How many are there? Are there 144,000? No. They are a number that is too great to be counted. Too great to be counted. So, how many are there? Well, Genesis 22, 17 gives us the answer. Let's look at Genesis 22, 17. I will certainly bless you. I will multiply your descendants beyond number. Like the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Your descendants will conquer the cities of their enemies. And through your descendants, all nations of the earth will be blessed. All because you have obeyed me. There's your answer. That's how many will be there. As many as there are stars in the sky and sands on the seashore. And they're clothed in white robes. And they um, and white robes represents righteousness. And so what Jesus is trying to say in this vision is that they are clothed in 
righteousness. Let's go to uh, verse 10. Oops, wrong chapter. And they were shouting with a mighty shout. Salvation comes from our God who sits on the throne and from the Lamb. So here is the next time in heaven that we see worship after the great tribulation. Um, and what are they shouting? They're shouting salvation comes from Father God and from Jesus Christ, the lion who is the lamb. And in verse 11 and 12, and all the angels were standing around the throne and the elders and the four living beings, and they fell before the throne with their faces to the ground, and they worshiped God. They sang, Amen, blessing and honor and wisdom and thanksgiving and glory and power and strength belong to our God forever and ever. And so what happens here? All of heaven begins worshiping God, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They worship the Trinity. And in verse 13, Uh, that should say verse 13 up there on the screen. The one, then one of the 24 elders asked me, Who are these who are clothed in white? Where did they come from? That's the million dollar question. Who are these people? Where did they come from? That's the million dollar question. Verse 14 gives us the answer. And I said to him, Sir, you are the one who knows. John has no idea here. Sir, you're the one that knows, not me. Then he said to me, These are the ones who died in the great tribulation. They have washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb and made them white. <clears throat> so, who are these people? John didn't know, but they are the ones who died in the Great Tribulation. They've washed their robes in the blood of the Lamb. They are the believers who died for Jesus Christ for their testimony in the Great Tribulation. Verses, and then finally verses 15 through 17. Um, what I would like you to do is take a few minutes and just kind of meditate on these path, on these verses here and um, talk about what stands out to you. That is why they stand in front of God's throne and they serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will give them shelter. They will never again be hungry or thirsty. They will never be scorned by the heat of the sun. For the lamb of the throne on the throne will be their shepherd. He will lead them to springs of life giving water and God will wipe every tear from their eyes. <clears throat> That's where we're going to end today. I want you guys to meditate and reflect on that passage. Also, next week, we'll finish up the seven seals. Um, we still haven't finished all seven yet, so we've seen the four global events, the four horsemen of the apocalypse. We've seen the first woe, um, which, was, um, which was the uh, uh, martyrdom. Of, of the saints and then we saw the 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 sixth seal open which is game over god's judgment and then we backed up we had an interlude with the 144,000 i hope you have a clearer picture of the 144,000 today and now next week we'll finish up with the seventh seal so see you next week god bless